That's classic. We bring you great laughs and a unique behind-the-scenes look at classic television shows and movies. I'm John Cato. I'm an actor, voiceover artist, and also bring you an amazing insight as a moderator with over 20 years' experience in the television industry. So today, um, I have uh, Johnny Whitaker from Family Affair. So, uh, you know, it, and, and many other many other shows. But uh, Johnny was kind enough to be on, and uh, I'm thrilled to have him on. I was a big fan uh, myself, but, uh, you know, of all of your childhood, uh, you know, acting accomplishments, just just phenomenal. And I know that uh, coming up, you have uh, CroftCon, uh, I believe, in a week or so. Is, uh, is that yes. right? Yes, uh, one week from today in uh, Orinda at the Orinda Theater. Wow. And how how far how far is that from like Los Angeles? Any any sense of a distance? Well, it's near Oakland and Berkeley. Okay. Okay, that's helpful because I'm sure so, people are going. Where is that? Yeah. Right. So if you're in Northern California, it's easy. If you're in Southern California, you'll have to fly or take. Uh, well, everything's expensive today, so. <laughs> yeah, that's an understatement. That is an understatement. Uh, well, fantastic. Well, I'll tell you what. Why don't um, just you know, since that's coming up, why don't we why don't we start there? So you had Sigmund and the Sea Monsters. Um, what was it like working with like the Croft puppets and and that whole experience on that show? Well, I've got to say that I was um, just coming off of my starring role in Tom Sawyer. Right. And so with that, I mean, I was, you know, kind of a big wig. And Sid and Marty Croft wanted me to star in their new series. And uh, my agents and my mother and father and I discussed it and said, you got to give us a piece of the action. And uh, so I own 5% of Sigmund. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, I saw you were an associate producer on that. I did see that. Yes. And um, I got to choose my brother, Scott Colden. Wow. Um, because that was, you know, one of the things that I could do is help in the uh, choosing of my uh cohort and um you know there was a few boys um, you know there was different ones and then when scott colden came in mm -hmm. we had just finished uh, a year earlier doing a disney um wonderful world of color uh for disney a um called the uh, mystery in dracula's castle Right. Yeah, I remember that. And so when Scott came in, he looks like my brother. Uh, we'd already been brothers. And hey, let's get Scott to do this. So I was, um, you know, I'm sure not the only choice, but they let me, you know, give my input. And uh, we chose uh, Scott Colder. Wow, that's amazing. Was that... Well, the time that you spent on that show was that an enjoyable experience, or was it was it oh, stressful yeah. being uh, a producer on this? Well, um, I was more or less a producer in name, mm -hmm. but you know, got a, a little bit of perks, um, and uh, enjoyed playing with uh, these creatures um you know scott got to go underneath the rock and be um be the lobster mm -hmm. a couple of times um and it was just a fun set um everybody got along pretty well um and it was just fun to to be there yeah really you mentioned I really look forward to it. 
You mentioned Tom Sawyer, and I can't let that one go, obviously. By the way, one of my favorites that you that you did. And I know uh, Jody Foster was part of that as well. Um, yeah, yeah you- Jody and I yeah. had played in a Disney film, Napoleon and Samantha. Yeah, Michael Douglas. And, exactly. And the three of us were kind of the stars of the show. Mm-hmm. Uh, Will Gear played my grandfather. I saw Ellen Corby was on there too. How yes. weird! Right before the Walton. Both, both, both Walton grandparents were in that. Crazy. And also, also Mary Wicks, who played uh, Zelda in Sigmund. Wow. Was in that film, but yeah, Jody and I were um, friends, and actually that year. Jody had turned nine mm-hmm. and was supposed to be going into Le Lycée Francais, which is the French school in Los Angeles, a very hoity toity French school. Wow. And so uh, Jody and I, that summer, along with Mrs. Seaman, our studio teacher, studied French. And so Jody and I, got to uh, practice speaking French together. She definitely speaks a whole lot better French than I do. Uh, However, I can hold my own pretty well. And um, I just remember saying to each other, c'est une voiture, répétez, which means there is a car, repeat. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, memories. Yeah, I understand that yeah. you're fluent in quite a few languages. Is that true? Yes, I speak five languages fluently. Uh, English, Portuguese, Spanish, French, and uh, ASL or American Sign Language. Wow, that's amazing. That really is. Now, hey, the other thing with Jody Foster, obviously, I saw it and you see it come up every time they mention the two of you, is that it's her first screen kiss. Was that weird between you guys? I mean, obviously your kids. Well, um, had I known what the word butch meant, which I guess is kind of a tomboy, um, definitely Jody Fox was a tomboy. Yes. But uh, I... You know, it was, we had practiced the kit a few times. We had to do it for the um, the screen test. Mm-hmm. And then uh, we did it again in the film. But if you look at the way that I give her a kiss, it's really tender and sweet. Yeah. And Jody's going. <laughs> yeah, and, right. Uh, but I was very gentle and kind on her first screen kiss. That's awesome. Did you did you have a good relationship with Michael Douglas, by the way? I mean, that was uh, kind of early on in his career, actually, too. Yes, very much. Um, he uh, was, I mean, he was the son of Kirk Douglas, of course. Yeah. But hadn't had a whole lot of uh, recognition. But yeah, he was very nice. And later on, his brother and I, or his half-brother, uh, mm-hmm. Eric Douglas and I started uh, hanging out with each other, and um, my drug addiction got heavier uh, because of him. <laughs> well, I mean, Eric, I'm not going to blame it on him. No, Eric, I know, had his own problems. Yeah, obviously. Yeah. I partied with Eric a whole lot, mm-hmm. and uh, because mm-hmm. he had the money. He got the girls and the blow, and I was able to party with him because he didn't like partying by himself. Wow. Uh, <laughs> how, did, but, how, how did you, by the way, I mean, I know that drug addiction, you're very open about it, and obviously what you're working on now. How did you transition, you know, what was the moment that you, you were like, I'm done with this? Um. My family had an intervention on September 12th, uh, uh, 1998. Mm -hmm. 
and I had promised that I would stop doing drugs and alcohol. But I continued until September 24th, and that night, it just stopped working for me. I couldn't get high. And um, that's when I decided to try sobriety. Mm -hmm. And, you know, from September 25th, 1998 till today, one day at a time, I that's stayed right. clean and sober, you know, for 24 years. That's and, uh, about, awesome. About five years into my recovery, five years into my recovery, I uh, got a, uh, a friend who uh, told me to start taking some classes. And uh, in a year, I was a certified addiction treatment counselor. That's incredible. What an honor. So for about the past uh, 20 years, I've been a certified drug and alcohol counselor. Has that been a, a rewarding experience for you? Uh, rewarding emotionally, financially, absolutely not. <laughs> sure, sure. But um, I have a nonprofit called Paso por Paso, which means step by step. And the main reason for it is to help the Spanish speaking addict alcoholic find treatment and recovery. And uh, the, uh, you know, I uh, work mostly with non English speaking uh, individuals. Uh, it's for all languages. I mean, I've had some French clients mm -hmm. um, and some Spanish, also some Roma um, mm -hmm. clients. I don't speak Roma, uh, which is gypsy. Oh, I catch you. But um, I, you know, understand. And the whole purpose of Paso por Paso is helping individuals who have different cultures mm -hmm. and helping them understand what's necessary to stay clean and sober. Gotcha. Gotcha. Did, um, you know, obviously, I mean, it's a weird segue into family affair, but, uh, you know, Anissa, obviously that was a shame. And, 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 and I, I've read a couple of things. I've read one that you were not surprised that this happened to her. And I also have read that you felt like she didn't necessarily want to act is, uh, what what's the what's the truth behind all that both of both are true basically once family affair ended in two in 1971 um basically because cbs was going through a change in uh the hierarchy there mm -hmm. and um Brian Keith used that as a good excuse to not renew his contract. Mm -hmm. And uh, most contracts are only good for five years. Right. And so right. that was our fifth season. And um, Anissa and I had just prepared to start a, uh, a newspaper for Don Federson Productions. Wow. Because they had Family Affair and To Rome With Love. And, you know, we were all on um, the studio lot together. Anyway, when we found out that Family Affair was canceled, we were more upset about the fact that we wouldn't become journalists as knowing that we lost our job. Wow. <laughs> wow. Isn't but, that something? Yeah. I mean, but that's, you know, 10, 11 year old. Sure. So um, Anissa liked to act, but she did not like the, she didn't like being recognized and she didn't like the publicity. Mm -hmm. And uh, which unfortunately is par for the course. Right. Um, and so she chose not to go on to audition for other things after family affair she and her mother 
um, were in some very bad situations. Anissa had been forced into a juvenile hall by her mother. Oh my gosh. And uh, she got out and uh, wanted to go live with her father and then also with her grandmother. Hmm. But um, Paula, her mother, um, held her very tightly. And uh, anyway, Anissa got in with the wrong crowd. Yeah was um 18 had just gotten her money from um her coogan fund money yeah and she had a bunch of friends who were under 18 some that were over 18 but she was the only 18 year old who had a car and money um and so they went to this dr feel good in oceanside and a friend's house in Oceanside and partied. Anissa left the party to come back to her house in Playa del Rey. Wow. And they called and said, you know, we want you back here. And so she turned around and drove back, you know, a hundred and some odd miles yeah, back that's to a good Oceanside. Distance. Yeah. And that's when uh, she took more drugs and passed out. And when the friend saw that she was passed out, they left and called from a payphone 911. Mm. And when the, um, uh, you know, the emergency people got there, she had aspirated wow. and died in her vomit. Oh, man. But um, that's the story that I understand from what I have read and mm -hmm. kind of put together with her autopsy report. Um, and um, very sad. And, yes. you know, the, the country mourned for oh, Mary yeah. and Joe. Right. Well, what about to um, Brian Keith? I, I, I was fascinated by the fact that you were in The Russians Are Coming. The Russians Are Coming with Brian Keith. And then I read that he's the impetus of how you ended up with Family Affair. Is, is that true? The Russians are coming, the Russians are coming, was originally supposed to be a New England town, fishing town. But we filmed it in Fort Bragg, California, up north on the yeah. coast. And um, Brian Keith, Jonathan Winters, Theodore Bakel, wow. um, Carl Reiner. Oh. They were all stars of this film. And we were all staying in the same, you know, motel there in Fort Bragg. And um, one day, Brian Keith knocks on my door and says, can Johnny Whitico come out to play? And, you know, my mother is this 30 some odd pretty woman, but looking at this movie star, Brian Keith, uh, 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 hello, Mr. Keith, <laughs> you know, oh, hey. you can call me Brian. Goes, okay, can Johnny Whitaker come out to play? And so I came out and um, we started throwing a ball around and he showed me how to throw a, you know, a ball, a baseball. And um, so, you know, we got along well. Then his next project was to begin family affair mm -hmm. and um when he knew that there was a 10 year old boy a six-year-old girl a 10 year old boy and a 16 year old girl but um he said well you know this kid johnny whitaker he's a really good actor and a uh, good kid i want him to be in the show so write a, a, a role for you know the next door neighbor or something that you know, the age of Buffy. And so when they did the, um, the screen test, I was the only six-year-old boy with all of these 10-year-old boys. Wow. And uh, when they, you know, put me up against Pamela and Ferdin, which oh. was going for the role of, of Buffy, and uh, I think Aaron Moran 
as well. Wow. And Anissa Jones. But when they saw that Anissa and I looked alike, they decided to change it to twins. Wow. So, you know, that's the Hollywood magic that happened. Yeah. Yeah. Without a doubt. Now, Brian, you know, obviously it was a, a very sad again. He, you know, he, he ended up taking his life and I, I know that he had uh, cancer. Had you stayed in touch with him or had you lost touch over that time? Well, um, I was working downtown LA as a computer guy mm -hmm. when I saw, um, what is it? Hardcastle and McCormick were filming next to the office building where I was working. And so I decided at my lunch break to sneak over there. I saw his wife and um, I said, I'm going I, you know, can I come and say hi to Brian? She goes, yeah, let's go surprise him. So I went onto the set. He was in his dressing room, knocked on the door. And, you know, we hugged and we talked for a little bit until he had to get back on the set. Then I went back to work and, um, you know, we would see each other on occasion at, uh, I think, Hardcastle and McCormick was NBC and, Fa and Sigmund was NBC. Mm. So um, we did, you know, I would see him at galas and stuff like that. Um, but before he passed, a fan had told me at one of the autograph shows, like the CrossCon, he, uh, this fan told me that Brian Keith was in his last days and that uh, he was very, very ill with cancer. And wow. uh, so I called a couple friends of mine and I got his home number. And I called Brian um, and I was expecting a nurse or a secretary or his wife to answer the phone. And he goes, hello. And I go, hello, Brian. Who the hell's this? <laughs> oh, hi, Brian. This is, uh, this is John, Johnny Whitaker. Johnny Whitaker. How the hell did you get my phone number? Oh my God. I said, Brian, I got it from the police of the police. And I swear, I will not give your phone. Yeah, everybody is getting my phone number and I'm getting calls from people, weird people. And I said, don't worry, Brian, I promise between you, me and God, I will not give your phone number away. Wow. And, and he goes, well, how the hell are you? And I said, well, I'm, I'm doing pretty well, but I understand that you're pretty sick. He says, yeah, the doctors give me five F's and days to live. Wow. And I said, wow. He says, and my Daisy, she just died a month and a half ago. She died of a cocaine overdose. Right. And uh, his daughter Daisy was like the apple of his eye. And it was a really hard thing for him. And um, anyway, we talked for a good, good 10, 15 minutes. And uh, my mother, my sister had just passed away. Oh, wow. And I said, you know, um, Mothers and fathers should not go to their children's funerals. No. And he says, yeah. I said, well, you know, my mother, my sister passed away. Would you like to talk to my mom? And my mother always gave Brian good family tips and how to be a good dad and all of that. Yeah. So um, he said, I'd love to, to talk to her. So I called my mom after that. And my mom talked to him for a little bit. And they commiserated, you know, a little bit about their child having wow. that. Wow. Um, and then, uh, you know, five days later, I hear that Brian has met the Grim Reaper on his own terms. Yeah. And that shot himself. And uh, that day he was supposed to die, uh, according to the medical doctors. And he just you know, I don't think it was suicide. It was, I don't want to wait. Mm -hmm. If I'm going, I'm going on my terms. And he had a few, a full Catholic funeral. Oh, really? And to my understanding in the Catholic faith that if you commit suicide, you are not allowed a full Catholic funeral. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah. And I, I mean, I'm not Catholic, but that's what I understand. Yeah, yeah. 
he and the priest, uh, and the priest was a nice old um, Irishman, and Brian and his family, of course, were English Irish, mm -hmm. and uh, you know had a full Catholic funeral. So I believe that for whatever reason, Brian had talked it over with the priest or whatever. I you know I'm I'm not so sure. Right, that's but, amazing. Uh, but um, three days later, I was driving home from work when all of a sudden um, I'm driving 65 miles an hour down the five freeway and all of the cars in front of me stop. And so I press on my brake and my car starts to swerve and I swerve right into the underneath part of a semi. Oh my I gosh. I had a sports car, but just before I hit, I heard Brian yell, cover, duck, roll. Seriously? So I, seriously, I swear. I covered my head, I ducked down to the side, just as the top of the car was sheared off. Oh my gosh. And the next day when I went to pick up my car at, or my belongings, the car was totaled at the junkyard, um, the uh, owner or manager of the yard said, you don't mind me asking what happened to the man or woman who was driving that car? Oh my God. Well, he said, you're looking at him. He says, I am not seeing a ghost. He wow. Said, in my 30 years, this kind of an accident, I've never seen anybody survive. Right. That's really and crazy. And I know, I know for sure that it was Brian Keith who, you know, said, hey, Johnny, I'm not going to, it's not your time right now. I'm, I've been authorized to tell you to cover dark roll. <laughs> That's really something. I'm I'm a big believer in that kind of stuff. Uh, so I, I yeah I'm with you. I think that's just an incredible thing. So what now the other side of this? Uh, obviously, uh, there's Kathy Garver, and I know that you know you, you, there's been all this up and down. And then I saw the thing with Oprah when you show up at her house and all that. Basically, and where are you guys? At, you know, at this point, I love Kathy. Um, but we have done a, um, an autograph show in, uh, Kanab, Utah for the Southern Utah heritage, mm -hmm. cowboy heritage, something. And last year she would not take a picture with me nor talk to me. Ah. Um, you know, uh, I have decided to, you know, turn it over. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, I have no ill will. Um, I think I've asked forgiveness for omission and commission, mm -hmm. uh, things that I, you know, may, or, you know, she claims that I've done and, yeah. um, nothing else I can do when I've cleaned my side of the street. You know, that's all I can do. I get and, you. And uh, uh, God bless her. You know, I only wish the best for her. I, you know, feel that 50, uh, 50 years of family affair came and went, and we could have done some really nice things for the fans, but um, it just wasn't possible or didn't happen. And that, that's okay. I get you. I get you. And I can't let it go without mentioning Sebastian Cabot. I mean, how do, how do I, we, we went through the whole show. How, how can I not mention him? I haven't heard, I haven't heard anything like, wow, you know, terrible about him. What, what, uh, what was he like? Well, Brian Keith, similar to Anissa, loved to act, but didn't like any of the publicity stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, it's, still it goes hand in hand and it's necessary but he just didn't like it um sebastian 
reveled in the celebrities. Wow. And any time that, you know, there was um, some newspaper or some kind of uh, uh, reporters on the set or whatever, he would grab the kids and say, hey, let me read you uh, Winnie the Pooh for a photo, you know. But it was great. I mean, what's better than having Sebastian Cabot Oh. read Winnie the Pooh to you. you yeah, know. I mean, it gets no better. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so, um, you know, for photo ops and all, it was, you know, grab the kids and uh, Brian and, and Sebastian would kind of fight over, um, you know, Sebastian always did this. Yes. His, yes. You know, and that's so that the focus of the audience goes to him. And so Brian would go like that and oh bring my the gosh. focus back to him. <laughs> Funny. But, um, you know, that I remember Sebastian saying to, you know, when we, Brian, we would play with, we'd jump on his back and he'd throw us around and throw us up in the air and, uh, the only thing is, is you don't touch the tube. He had a little toupee. Oh, funny. I never knew head. that. I never knew Brian Keith had a toupee. That's too funny. Yeah. Okay. And, he, you know, and you can play and do anything you wanted with Brian, but don't mess with the tube. And um, Sebastian, it was always the actor prepared. Oh, my gosh. I'm happy to talk with you but we must rehearse our lines and be prepared. The actor prepares. Wow. And so Brian Keith would know his lines kind of, and, you know, just say whatever and do it. And then Sebastian was, you know, so I got two different ways of, um, of acting. Yeah, I could see that. And they both, they both had a percentage of the show. Isn't Is that correct as well? I don't know about Sebastian, but I do know okay. that Brian Brian did own some of it. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. Did um, uh, what was I gonna? Oh, I, I gotta ask you one. This is good. I had um, Erin Murphy, Tabitha from Bewitched, on a fantastic woman, by the way, and she said, "Beautiful." What, if, what was that? Gorgeous, beautiful. Or, she's gorgeous, beautiful, and kind as they come. But she said a story. She mentioned you. She said that when you were on for Jack and the Beanstalk, she still to this day remembers you taking her across the street to lunch and pulling your own checkbook out to write a check. Now, now is that is that true? If she said it, it must be. <laughs> well, she had a really good memory of you uh, being on their show and stuff like that. Was that a good experience for you? Oh, yes. I mean, you know, growing up, in you know you're in your mid to middle 50s Mm -hmm. that's correct so um anybody you know in our age bracket i'm 62 um you know there was always the fight who's the hottest is it Mm -hmm. tabith is it um samantha or is it genie right and uh, you know i was always on the samantha train yeah and so uh, when I got to me- go on the set and saw her, it was like, oh, oh my goodness, <laughs> this is Elizabeth Montgomery. Oh my goodness! Wow. And I mean, I was I was just starstruck. Wow. And uh, you know, got to do a couple of scenes with her and got to watch how they did the the disappearing and the appearing. And uh, That's cool. I just thought, wow. And so, you know, I was on the set and I had a ball doing that. And it was uh, very memorable. Did, um, did, what was the, the energy, I guess we could say, of the set of Family Affair compared to the energy that you kind of got when you were on the Bewitched set? Well, of course, I was, Anissa and I mm-hmm. were the show. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there's no doubt about it. Kathy Garver 
and Sebastian and Br Brian were support supporting characters to Buffy and Jody. Nobody right. really, uh, I mean, 80% of the population turned on the TV to find out what was happening with Buffy and Jody. Oh, definitely. You know, um, so, you know, we were always coddled and loved. When I went on to the set there, of course, I was, you know, my, I was down on the, on the totem pole. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was a guest star, but um, they were very kind and, and, and nice. I mean, there was, you know, um, energy. I don't remember anything much different. I just remember that she had either, I mean, she was still in the series pregnant. And this this was the the episode just before Adam was born. Oh wow, wow! And so I don't remember if she was still pregnant or if she had just had her child. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, I do remember that she. Um, well, I think I remember her drinking. So she probably was not, that was one of the things that um, Mr. Asher and she, when she came off the set, had a glass of wine for her. How interesting. Yeah. Well, they were married. Yeah. They were, yeah. They were a couple. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, that's one thing that I, you know, that kind of sticks out in my mind. Yeah. So, so I, I'm hoping that she was already had given birth. Gotcha. Gotcha. Very interesting. Hey, one other one that was in there was Snowball Express. <laughs> kind of throwing that in there. It's one of my favorites. Um, you know, it's, it was cool. You got yourself, you got Dean Jones, you got Keenan Wynn, you got Harry Morgan. First of all, where did you shoot that? And what was it like working with, you know, like Dean, Dean Jones and Keenan Wynn? What was that like? Well, Dean Jones was a very nice man. I mean, he was a big Disney star at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, uh, Nancy Olson played my mother. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. And uh, Keenan Wynn was the bad guy. Yeah. And he, he yeah. played a really good bad guy. Um, but we did um, most of the filming in Crested Butte, Colorado. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay, okay. And we did some of the filming at Disney Studios, but most of it was um, uh, at uh, in Crested Butte. And what uh, what happened was we. I, I was not one of them, you know, didn't have a lot of the role. I mean, mm -hmm. I played uh, the Baxter's son. Right. But my teacher, uh, Mrs. Seaman, or was it, I think it was Mrs. Deeney. Maybe it was, anyway. The yeah. teacher yeah. said that we had to have three hours of school every day. And when I was not working that day, I was supposed to get four hours of school. And one of those hours was to be banked. Huh. Which meant that if I was working, I would be able to not have to um, have three hours of school. I could have two hours of school. Interesting. Anyway. So, uh, but Crested Butte, the um, snow people there, or the the um, the ski resort, I had a pass that I could go anytime, anywhere that I wanted, go up and ask for candy. And candy was a really buxom, beautiful redhead, was <laughs> my ski instructor. Oh and my so gosh. Mrs. Seaman would allow me to use that one hour, extra hour as PE. Wow. And I went, uh, you know, for the next two or three hours 
in a class with uh, the with uh, uh, with Candy, this cute little you know redhead. Wow. And um, got to go shushing all over the place. That's pretty cool. Did was it was Keenan Wynn much of a, a kid kind of guy, or or was he one of those actors that he kind of stayed away from the kids? Well, of course, um, he was nice. I mean, we I didn't have a whole lot of scenes with him. Right. I think the one right. scene I had with him was when my father, Dean Jones, went in to ask for a loan. And, At the bank. Um, right. And I yeah. was telling him, you know, whatever I told him that he finally listened to me. Um but because uh, like all Disney movies, the kids always know the right thing to do. Right, right. <laughs> it's true. It's true. But but I, I don't remember him being negative. Um, so I, 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 I perceive that he was a nice guy, you know. Yeah, yeah. You had, um, I mean, you had quite a few shows that were in there during that time. You had Gunsmoke, Adam 12. Um, Bonanza. What was that? <laughs> Two Green Acres, two uh, Gunsmokes, a Lancer, and a Bonanza. Did you, uh, out of those shows, do you have any good, you know, like special memories of any of them? Well, Bonanza specifically, mm -hmm. I had my eighth birthday or my ninth birthday. I got to look at the numbers. Yeah. Um, on the set. Wow. And... Um, I'm pretty sure that the director of that episode was um, um, what's the star? Uh, Lauren Green or Michael oh, Landon? Michael uh, Landon. Yeah. I'm pretty okay. sure that Michael Landon was the director and um, good old Haas um, he made sure that the whole set celebrated my birthday. Wow. Had a great big cake for me. And uh, he bought me chaps and a big seven gallon hat. Wow. And, um, you know, real stuff, real cowboy boots. I mean, the whole nine yards. And I just remember that birthday on the set. Did, was when you say the set, I know that was that at the studio or was that like on location? We did all of my bonanza on uh, on this in the studio set. I see, I see. Where did they shoot that? Actually, it's, do you remember? That's where I'm, I think it was at. Um, on the Paramount lot. Okay, could have been, could have been, yeah. It's I guarantee you the way things work with this show, someone will write in later and say, no, it was on the whatever lot. Hello. They always do. But, um, exactly. yeah. Um, the other thing, Gunsmoke, you have two episodes uh, that are are back to back. They're like part one, part two. Well, no, actually there were three. Three? Because there was a two-parter and then I did another episode. Oh, wow. Related to still the other two, the two-parter? No, the oh, first separate. one okay. was separate, but the other one was um, uh, was done uh, as a two-parter. I got with Ellen, Burst, Ellen Burstyn played my mother. Wow, wow, top top of the. I mean, it's you know, great actress. Well, just one of the last things too. I know that you were a talent agent. I know your sister uh, is a talent agent. I I, I think still yeah. right. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you. I read that you had signed Dana Plato right before she passed away. Did Did you have any sense of her at that point? Like, wow, she's having some issues because you'd been there, obviously. Well, what happened is, um, I believe it was the movie Gods and Kings that. Um, Clooney was starring in and George he specific Clooney. George Clooney mm -hmm. and he specifically requested that Dana audition for a role in this film um, and 
the requests come across the wires, as they call them. Now it's, uh, it's an email, uh, but at the time it was a, a specific, um, kind of like the newswire, but it mm -hmm. was uh, specific to television and uh, commercials. And it just said, we're looking for the talent representation for Dana Plato. Mm -hmm. And um, Todd Bridges and I uh, had the same agent for a while. And then his father became his agent. And um, I had his phone number and I called him and I said, hey, you know, they're looking for Dana. Do you know anything about, you know, getting in touch with Dana? And he gave me her phone number. Wow. So wow. I, I called her and I said, hey, Dana, you know, this is Johnny Whitaker. Oh, hi, Johnny. We'd met at a talk show something or other on Kid Stars. And, um, you know, she knew who I was. And I said, do you currently have any representation for SAG or Afterward? And she goes, well, I'm kind of in the middle and I'm looking for, you know, someone. I said, well, I'm looking for talent. And I'm looking specifically for you. Yeah. If you'd be interested, come down and have a meeting. So she came down, had a meeting. Um, I, at the time, had maybe two, three years clean and sober. Mm -hmm. And she claimed to have 10 years clean and sober. Oh, wow. But when she, you know, presented herself, she was clean and she was, but she was a little speedy. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, but again, my job was not to get her or keep her clean and sober. Right. My job was to get her a job. Of course. And, you know, not that I wasn't concerned, but when she said she had 10 years sober, I was going to believe her. Yeah. Until I had, you know, reason not to. Mm -hmm. And um, so I did tell her that, uh, you know, what was going on and that George Clooney had specifically asked for her. And so um, I got the script, you know, got her, we went over the line a few times. She wow. went on the audition wow. and she didn't get it, but another producer uh, had heard that she had come to work with me and uh, we got her a, uh, job for the summer doing summer stock wow. in a play that would go around the um, southeastern United States mm -hmm. and um, she then wanted to do that but she wanted to do it with her son that was living with um, his father's mother his grandmother and uh, so uh, she bought a Winnebago so that she could drive with the, the cast yeah. and save money and take the money from, you know, the per diem yeah. and pay for yeah. gas and all of that. So that was her plan. And that was her motor home that she had and that she was going to have her son with her that whole summer. Oh my gosh. And, uh, unfortunately, um, you know, there was a, a about a two week period where she was just she had hid away because a girlfriend of hers who claimed to be her lesbian lover um, had called the police for, uh, um, you know, because she didn't know where she was. Yeah. And she was um, so I had called her son and her ex-mother-in-law asking if they knew where she was. And uh, her son said, mom's fine. She's safe. She just doesn't want anybody or any, you know, publicity or anybody to, to find her. I said, hey, okay. Um, just let her know that, you know, she has a meeting uh, in a couple of weeks and I wanted to go through some stuff with her on the play. Yeah. And yeah. Um, and he goes, okay, I'll let mom know. And um, I think he was 13 or 14 at the time. Wow. 
And um, then she, without my knowledge, uh, went to Chicago for a blue movie um, uh, con. Yeah. Because she'd done some blue movies. Right. And um, was supposed to be a big star there. Then they flew to New York to do the um, uh, Howard Stern show. Oh my God. Both, both things that I didn't know about. Wow. And then the next day she flew back to uh, Moore, Oklahoma, uh, where she fell into a deep depression and did some cocaine and meth and other pills and died. Unbelievable. Unbelievable tie-in. Johnny, all I got to say is you are a lucky man. You are a lucky man. You're, you're sober 20, what did you say, 24 years? You're not, yep. you, you've, you've been around it, um, you know, oh, your phone fell there. Um, you've been around all of this tragedy and all these things, and you're still here. So, you know, I'm, nobody's I'm watching still... over you, man. Hey, I, I, I truly believe that uh, I am, God has blessed me greatly. Big time, big time. I agree with you. Um, so look, I, I always let everybody when I'm, uh, you know, when I end my podcast, if there's anything that you want to, uh, like as far as from a charity standpoint or anything like that, that you'd like to put out, maybe tell them about, you know, ProfCon, anything that you'd like to end as far as where you're at. And Absolutely. Well, um, May 21st, I will be in Orinda, California, which is near Berkeley, and between Berkeley and uh, um, Oakland mm -hmm. on the East Bay. And we'll be there all day the 21st. I think there's a special dinner on the 20th, but I'm not sure exactly what, what the plan mm -hmm. is. Then um, I uh, will be coming back and working until uh, June 4th. I am going to be in LA for the um big opening of a series that i just am a part of called the last evangelist okay. and you can okay. go to david hevener h-e-a-v-e-n-e-r dot tv and get information on that and then um fourth of july weekend i will be in um arrow rock missouri where we filmed tom sawyer for 50 years since the filming of Tom Sawyer for a big celebration wow. and a big, uh, a big uh, Missouri style barbecue and 4th of July picnic. And then a big showing of the movie and lots of other things that uh, Jeff East and I will be doing there as uh, two of the stars. I'm not sure if anybody else is coming that I know of yet. And then uh, August 31st is International Overdose Awareness Day. Okay. And uh, every August or early September, I celebrate the lives of those who've lost their lives due to overdose. One is Anissa, another is Dana, um, Eric Douglas, um, and... Um, Anissa's brother, lots of different individuals that I have yeah. in my life. Um, and we celebrate about a hundred different people by reading their names. If any of the, the fans or friends of yours and people have family or friends that have died of an overdose, send that information to johnny at johnnywhitaker.com or overdose awareness. 0831 at gmail.com and with a picture you're more than welcome to join us and share a little bit about that individual um because those we read off the names and if, if there's a loved one they get to share a little bit about their loved one and and um how they passed and um you know just so that they did not die in vain. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you can go to johnnywhitaker.com and you can, most of the time, all of the things that I'm doing, 
Um, if you give me when this is going to be airing, I'll put that up there as well. Okay, great. And um, then uh, you can also find me on Twitter. You can become a Twitter. Um, <laughs> and um, you can just uh, find me on Facebook and um, just about anywhere. Okay, great. Well, and by the way, I will get this to you, and especially I'll get it to you before uh, CroftCon, so that I, you know, hopefully people can hear it and can show up and see you. So that'd beautiful. Be All right, Sounds good. Johnny, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for uh, your honesty and your time and and uh, your thankfulness. It's been uh, it's been great talking with you. Thank you. God bless. All right, same to you, Johnny. See ya. Hey, if you haven't done so already, hit the subscribe button in the corner of the video so that you don't miss any of our future YouTube podcasts. Also, follow us on iTunes and Spotify and leave us a review.